Hi, my name is John Kim, and I'm a therapist who went through his own rebirth. I share my feelings and revelations. I believe in casual or clinical and with you instead of at you. I come unrehearsed on purpose because self-help doesn't have to be so complicated. Drake has a song. Well, he has many songs, but he has this one song where there's a lyric that says, Noel and I have been at it before Twitter names. And every time I hear that, I think about this guest that I'm going to have on today that I'm really excited about. Uh, her name is Noel Cordo, and her last name always uh, reminds me of Fancy Mustard for some reason. Anyway, we have been at it before Twitter names. Um, I don't know if technically we have, but it's been like six or seven years since we've been working online and uh, building communities and graduating uh, Catalyst Life Coaches and building a startup, all of that. So I met Noel. She was a, one of the first people who, um, when I was building The Angry Therapist and just blogging on Tumblr, uh, I started to, uh, I went from having a full practice to um, needing help and I didn't know what to do and I was broke at the time. Um, so I just kind of asked people if they wanted to be on Team Angry. It just kind of sounded like it was cool because I had a team, which I, I didn't. Um, and she was one of the first to email me, and she's a talented writer. So we connected that way. Um, and then I've known her ever since, not only as a friend, but also a business partner and uh, teacher, uh, mentor, um, all of that good stuff. And she's on this podcast, um, not only because of that, but she actually has an amazing story. Um, she's going to talk about how she went from eating disorders to divorce to re rebirth to um, running a startup and all of that. It's a really great episode. She's one of the few that hold up. And I talk about this concept of holding up in my book, Miserable Fuck. Um, I think it's one of the greatest compliments that you could give someone, you know, especially today with the internet and how you can really uh, portray yourself in a way that's not honest. Noelle has always been someone who, um, she is who she says she is, you know, and she is, uh, one of also one of our instructors. She teaches positive psychology and she also practices a lot of the stuff, um, that she teaches, which I think is, is amazing because a lot of teachers, um, fall under the category uh do as i say and as i do and she definitely does not ladies and gentlemen gentlemen noel cordo all right noel so um you know that you know that saying uh dance like no one's watching yes so the concept of my podcast is basically talk like no one's listening and then hopefully people will listen so that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> we're going to just have an honest, ridiculous, amazing, um, or w wherever the conversation goes, we're just going to hang out. Uh, and I always find that those are the, the best episodes, or th those are the ones that I enjoy the most. I feel like that's where our expertise is. Yes, yes. And so I want you to take off all your hats. I want you to take off your CEO hat and your life coaching hat. And, or, you know, you could just put them aside. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll put them back on later. Um, but for now, I want to actually get into your personal story. Um, and I would like to start with um, your upbringing. Where did you grow up? How, what was that like? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Cool. This is stuff I, I don't talk about a lot. Awesome. I know. That's um, why I'm doing it. Fun, fun. So <laughs> I grew up in New Jersey. Yes. On the beach in a little tiny town that is south of New York. So culturally, in many ways, it was a suburb of New York City. And if you've heard of Asbury Park and Bruce Springsteen and the Stone yes. Pony, yes. that's where I that's where I'm from. There's a, a movie called Blinded by the Light, and it's based on the, the music of Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen, um, and it's about an Indian guy who related to his music and, and, and left and um, went to Newberry Park. Is that where you grew up? And that, that whole area that you're talking about? It's Asbury Park. Oh, Asbury Park. Sorry. Asbury Park. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Newberry sounds cool, though. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm uh, a couple towns over. All the little towns are only a couple miles wide. Yeah, you told me once, because I'm actually a big fan of Bruce Springsteen, you told me once that his songs make you cry. 
They do. There, it, it is just like you know a lot of poignant. So yeah. you know a lot of the lyrics that he references. I know those streets. Like I right. literally know where those are. It's where my dad grew up. Um, so I'm super familiar with it lyrically. So are you an only child? I have a younger sister. Her right. name is Kara, mm-hmm. and uh, Kara also means beloved, which is fitting. She is my mm. world. She is my world. I've never met her, but I've heard uh, many stories about her, and it's it's so it's just weird to think that you have a sibling because I, I don't. I don't yeah. it's, it's a trip. So, how did you guys grow up? You guys grew up in a beach town. Um, what was that like? Well, what, 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 what were the parents doing? And, and how was up your upbringing for you? Yeah, so my parents, I have a great relationship with. Today, we worked really hard as a family to build our super healthy relationship as adults, mm-hmm. which, you know, hats off to my parents. Um, I grew up in a pretty strict Catholic household. So the, the little town that I grew up in is predominantly Catholic. I went to Catholic schools. From a kid perspective, though, my childhood was downright magical. Mm. You know, I was I could ride my bike to the ocean. There were lakes and streams and rivers to explore. I had a little boat that I could take out if I wanted to. And and my parents, you know, let me be free. I could bike wherever I wanted, go to the beach, go for a run on the boardwalk, come home. I always worked different little jobs in the tourist community. I waitressed. I worked at a coffee house. I even worked as um, one of the beach police. Oh, and wow. I had to go through the police academy to do that job. Yeah, that, yeah, that goes on the never again list. Um, so from from uh, having a, a actually magical childhood, you were free, a uh, small beach town. Um, when did life become complicated for you? So was it like a little bubble for you? And then what, what happened? You went to college. Where, when did life become less magical? So it's interesting. My parents, you know, understanding your upbringing and understanding who you are in context takes some work and some reflection. And my dad had a really, really solitary childhood. He spent most of his time by himself with his dog outdoors, fishing, hunting. And that experience was mirrored for me. And it was really a beautiful experience, but I am an off the charts extrovert. So I was lonely a lot as a little kid. So I was craving community. I was craving connection and craving, you know, culture really, which I didn't have a whole lot of access to. And then when I entered probably junior high, high school, that's when it got weird. Mm. Why did it get weird? You said you're an ex- you were uh, an off the charts extrovert, correct? Yeah, I, okay. and I still am. Right. I, I still am to a very large extent. I really do best when I'm around a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that tiny little beach town, you know, there wasn't that for me. But right. going into high school, there was. I went to high school in another city that was a bigger city. It was a bigger school. My cousins were at that high school. It was, you know, my little brain was just exploding with like, oh, my God, you know, so much to take in and see and think and feel. And there's such a disconnect between how I perceived myself and how others perceived me mm-hmm. that I've now come to understand from talking to my peers and talking to folks around me, I hung on to those feelings of loneliness and isolation, even as I was very embraced by my um, my high school community. Right. And I never really felt it. I always felt like I, I was doing it wrong, like there was something else that that, you know, there was magic beyond, you know, whatever I was experiencing. And that's when I really started to swirl around with eating disorders. So did you feel kind of like an outsider? Did you feel um, I did. people were different than you? And if so, yeah. wh- why? Well, um, I, something that I've really come to embrace in adulthood is my differentness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I am straight up different than most folks. I actually had my next door neighbor ask me that the other night I was popping off about Marxist feminism. And he said, you know, do you find that most people understand you or are like you? And I said, no, (laughs) I don't. (laughs) And that's okay. But as a kid, that, that those traits of mine were really confusing. 
And yeah, so I, didn't... I mean, you have to come into that difference and, and for it to be empowering. So as a kid, you being different wasn't an empowering experience. It was uh, isolating and, 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 um, and, and, and dispowering, right? It, it was internally. Yeah. And that's where it gets. It's really weird because um, I'm I'm charismatic as fuck. Like I'll own it, mm -hmm. and so I was prom queen. I was most likely to succeed. Mm. Um, wow. Scholarship to college, you know, all the while feeling very lonely, very different, very isolated, and very out of control with my body, with eating, right. with you know my perception of self. So on the outside, you were popular and, uh, you know, people wouldn't know all of the stuff that was happening on the inside. And on the inside, you were feeling the opposite, uh, isolation, lonely, different, all of that. Yeah. And, and talking to my high school peers, I'm shocked, shocked at the way that people remember me so fondly mm -hmm. and remember things that I said or did and really considered me to be a friend when I didn't really feel that way. Was part of your um, eating disorder from um, um, just just generally body image, media, television, advertising, all of that, or was it uh, something else? So, well, it's interesting. So, um, I'm, I, depression plays a large role in it. Mm. So, I come from now uh, three generations of major depression, and for me. Uh, I suspect that I'm a little bit more on the bipolar type B spectrum where mm -hmm. I swing yeah. between depression and energy. Um, and so, you know, I think that the real core root of the eating disorders was depression and that the eating disorders manifested as a way to control something right. about my existence and to force myself into an experience of thinness. And so, you know, looking at that objectively, that really started with binge eating around age seven. And then I was wow. in full blown anorexia, bulimia by age 14. That's really young. I mean, usually yeah. eating disorders happen at like, you know, 16, 17, high school, that peer pressure, all of that. So um, binging at seven is, is really young. Yeah, it was a way to solve feelings of isolation and loneliness. And sure. what I now recognize to be depression, which as a little kid is, you know, super confusing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you do you think that depression is genetic? You know, that's a chicken and egg question. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that my dad's mom suffered greatly in her lifetime, but she also had an impossibly sad life. Her family fell into poverty. She was the primary household caretaker for her brother and father who were alcoholics. She married my grandfather who ended up in a wheelchair. They had a very hard life. My dad came from a very poor family. Uh, so, you know, it, it, who's to say, is that genetic or is, are we really talking about intergenerational trauma that gets passed down? You know, my dad has memories of being very isolated as a child, um, moving out of their house in the summertime and into tents so that they could rent it out. And so, wow. you know, he, yeah. And so I, th I think that there's a little bit of genetic imprinting, probably a little bit of biological stuff, and then a little bit of nature versus nurture. Yeah, I think it was Brene Brown who said uh, regarding addiction that the, the gene loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. And I, I wonder if, you know, depression is, is similar. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I've never had full on depression. Um, but I am like you where I swing on the kind of bipolar, I swing on extremes. I either feel that uh, life is amazing and beautiful and, and, uh, and, and just, you know, I'm on, I'm on, on the clouds or I dip into hopelessness. Um, and I don't stay there that long, but I do swing in extremes. So I don't know how much yeah. of that, you know, I don't know how much of that is from my dad and addiction or how much of it is just, uh, from the way I was brought up. But, uh, so with you, uh, how, how did, how long was your eating disorder? And then w how did that play out? So, oh, after, gosh. After high school, so yeah, it, I mean, it's a major theme in my life. So I, I requested, um, not to go to college right away. And I probably mm -hmm. should have stayed home because I wasn't well. Um, but you know, parents do the best they can 
you know, you have a very high functioning child who from the outside world looks like everything's going great. And it's, you know, and that's something that I consistently and still experience is that I'm so high performing and I'm so capable of shouldering and managing mm-hmm. stress that when I'm actually in SOS mode, people are like, really? <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yes, yeah. I am. I'm suffering. Um, so off to college I went and that was probably a very bad idea because mm. I was just, you know, looking for that community, looking for that connection, looking for um, fun, looking to resolve my pain points. And I partied my ass off. Um, Where did you go to school and and what did you want to study? I went to Rutgers. Mm-hmm. I um I I wanted to study um, women's studies, but my dad Mm. told me that if I did that, I would never get a job. And so Mm. I settled for English literature with a focus on feminist literature. Oh, interesting. Uh, And I also studied comparative literature, a lot of political science, cultural anthropology. And, you know, I loved... I loved reading and I loved doing the work. Mm -hmm. Not so much actually sitting down and writing the papers, um, which I did with efficacy, you know, and managed to get get by. Um, but yeah, for me, college is kind of like a big gray cloud. There was a lot of trauma mixed in there and there were a lot of, you know, hard life (laughs) situations and poor choices. And I think everybody kind of knocks around like that in your, you know, I was, I was young when I went to college. I was, I was still 17 when I landed at Rutgers. I was young for my grade. Yeah. So, uh, was, was, was college. So then if high school was, was a good experience on the outside and, uh, internally you developed the eating disorder and then loneliness and all that, um, was college then freeing because there was, uh, parties and, and, uh, and I don't know, is that when you discovered Fish, <laughs> the band? Yeah, it, it, it is, actually. Right. End of high school, early college years. Yeah, I mean, college was um, was both dark and beautiful. You know, I have mm-hmm. so many fantastic memories of great friends, good times. That's when I kind of got my... Um, my wanderlust and I started rolling around the country, going to see a lot of different music, meeting cool people. And just, you know, um, I believe during that period of time is when I really solidified this concept of alternative society and different Mm -hmm. kinds of community and living in ways that are kind of outside the matrix. Yeah. And for uh, those of you guys who don't know fish, um, and I don't know Fish that well, but they're a band. And and from what I gather, the people who listen to Fish, they're like um, it's like great, the Grateful Dead. They they follow them, and they're very very uh, um, in, into them. They they tour with them. It's a lifestyle kind of. I mean, Fish. I was also really heavily into the rave scene in New York at the time. Enter parties and music and all of that. Um, did you date in college? Did you get into relationships or not so much? Yeah, I did. And it, it, it was, I mean, goodness gracious. So um, I, something that um, I have done throughout my life was um, kind of experience dating like a combat sport. Mm. And I, I dated casually and I never gave a fuck or really felt like, you know, attached to partners only to find out years later that people were like in love with me. And I was like, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, okay. Um, but I met my ex-husband and that was really my first um, serious experience with falling in love. And I was um, with him through the remainder of my years in college. So that was a big part of your life. And so you got into a very serious relationship really young. I mean, college. Super young. Yeah. Super. Uh, because that turned into a marriage, correct? Yep. And what was that like? Uh, now you're entering uh, your hero's journey. You're going from, from the, I guess, comfortable to the uncomfortable. I mean, I guess when, once you get married, uh, once you get married, and I was there, you, uh, you know, it's no longer about you. So it, it, it life can become very complicated. And you have to grow up very fast. Yeah. So um, I left college and I went to law school, 
And that goes on the list of never again. And that was also Mm. probably a bad idea. I mean, that's a great example of that I use in coaching a lot with my clients is, you know, when there's a goal that seems really incongruent with the human, I always have questions about whose goal is this? Is this your goal or is this somebody else's goal? And the law school goal was my family's goal. It wasn't mine. Um, And I didn't really understand what it would mean to be a lawyer and I got there and literally it's all rules. It's, 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 it is three years of learning rules and I don't like rules. Um, right. So I, I dropped out of law school. My husband, my ex-husband had followed me um, to law school, which is why I settled in Southern Pennsylvania. And, um, and I, I set about looking for a job and, I really lost myself to that relationship. I Mm. ceased to have intellectual pursuits. I was very, very, very depressed. Um, I was in my my early 20s. I was 22. Um, And I just really... I was, I was, I was stuck in every sense of the world. I didn't have my, my own um, income. I was completely financially reliant. I thought I was stupid. I was really depressed. I thought that mental illness, depression was a label that would define me. Um, and it really sucked. <laughs> yeah. So was did, was it good and then it got bad or was it um, it just got bad and it got worse? So um, uh, when you guys met, I mean, I mean I'm assuming there was, uh, you know, sparks and honeymoon and chemistry and exploration and all that. Or no? Yeah. Was it dysfunctional? I mean, there was. No, I mean, yeah, no, there, there were there were great early years. And mm-hmm. and we had fun, you know, setting up a house. But, you know, I think really, again, looking at myself in context, I'm so high performing that for me to have given up all agency, all efficacy, all intellectual pursuits and to just kind of be sitting around, you know, not doing much with myself and very codependently devoting all of my time and energy right. to making sure that, you know, my partner was, had his emotional um, needs met. That was a death sentence. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, of course, you know, looking back over any long extended period of time, there are bright spots, there are low spots, you know, it's all of the things. So you lost your sense of self. Uh, beyond. 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 I lost <laughs> myself completely. What was the result of that? Um, so basically Mm -hmm. now you're in a marriage, um, you're in quicksand, you're depressed. Is this when you started to gain weight again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is. That's when I, um, the marriage was also very emotionally unhealthy and, Mm -hmm. um, I was in many senses protecting myself from what was going on in the marriage and I gained a ton of weight and, um, I, I was obese. Yeah, in my early twenties. Yeah, it, this is actually really common. I, you know, a lot of clients that I have, um, and it it could be, uh, you know, everyone's story is different. But um, for example, if if someone has been through uh, sexual abuse, there's different roads that that they can take after that, and how it manifests into their, you know, their 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 mind, their body, all of that. And a lot of times, um, gaining weight is a way to protect yourself or to um, disconnect. Or to, it is. Yeah. It's very common, especially for women, to protect yourself from unwanted sexual advances. Right. It's it's super it's super common, and you know, in so many different ways, it's also a way of disappearing. Um, oh, that's so. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, um, and, you know, and the experience that I had, you know, I've been literally every single shape and size. And when I'm very thin, I get a lot of attention from guys. And when I'm medium sized, you know, not so much. And then when I'm um, very heavy, it's like men and women, I just don't exist. And so it was, I think, important to have that experience, especially coming from a place where I was very used to wielding my sexuality to get what I wanted and then to have this experience of like, oh, that's actually a privilege. So in your marriage, um, I'm assuming you, because of the uh, emotional disconnection, you didn't want to have sex. Part of or that kind of intimacy and that part of that uh, uh, gaining weight was to protect yourself from that, right? 
It was really complicated. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I eventually went into sex therapy is because, you know, sexuality is so complex. And a lot of times folks, especially when they're young, um, fall into marriages without having fully formed or explored their sexuality. And so then you end up with, you know, very, very, very different preferences. And that can cause some big problems. Yeah. What do you think about people? And this is um, especially like in the Midwest and stuff where you have this high school sweetheart, you get married early, you know, you run toward the big events, the kids, and then you're basically supposed to be with that person for the rest of your life. And you haven't had many experiences. Sometimes it's great. Yeah. You know, it, that, sometimes which is rare. <laughs> But yeah, but you know what, though, I think it's, um, I don't think it is terribly rare. You know, sometimes if if you get together with someone, and you really have the opportunity to learn each other sexually, and both partners are satisfied, and you can grow and change with each other. That's awesome. It seems like Um, it seems like it gets but it's challenging. Yeah, it seems like it's challenging first. And then if you get could get past that, then it can be great. Because when you're young well, and you haven't had a lot of sexual experiences, you're thirsty for that. Um, but then you may come around and value uh, uh, or deepen with your partner and then suddenly establish almost a, a new relationship with the same person. So there's um, something called a turn on template. And your turn on template changes over your lifespan. Have yeah, you? Um, for sure ever heard of, of Kinsey and all the interviews yeah, yeah. that he did of course. mapping sexuality and stuff. So your turn on template is based on your experiences, your fantasies and your hard wiring. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you start out in life, it's a combine, it's a, it's a random crap shoot. The way your the wires are connected in your brain, what you're exposed to sexually and then, you know, who you happen to knock into out in the world. And so, you know, from this point forward, neither you nor I know how our turn on template might unfold into our 40s, 50s, 60s. Right. Um, and then for folks who are very young, kind of same deal. So turn on templates are, are different from like types, the types that we are drawn to. Or no, is that the Yeah, same? no. You, you, your turn on template um, is basically your love map. Mm-hmm. And it is, um, it, it's really specific for sex and sexual acts and fantasy. And um, it's what you like. And it typically flows on three different continuums of, you know, asexuality through nymphomania. Um, then we have, you know, who are you attracted to? men, women, both, everything in between. Um, And then we have your skin hunger, the extent to which you physically like to be touched. Right. Not at all to, yes, I need to be touched very much. Yeah, so many layers there. Many. And then then toss in, you know, kink, fantasy, fetish, and you have a ball game. Yes, yes. (laughs) Well, and then toss in, you know, um, if you have addiction in your gene and and then, of course, uh, previous love experiences and uh, exposure to things. You know, when I was growing up, I was exposed to images and uh, things very young, like way too young and, you know, how that manifests later and all of that. Uh, And then, of course, for men, locker rooms and all that stuff. But okay, so after call uh, after marriage or or so how long was your marriage? Uh, we were together a total of 10 years. Yeah, it's a long time. That was actually... It's a long time. Wait, the, the marriage was 10 years or the, the marriage no. was five and then... The, the, we got, I got engaged when I was 23 or 24 and then married 26 and then I got divorced, started the process of getting divorced when I was 29. It was finalized shortly after I was 30. Yeah, so you were still really young. Um, after divorce, how did you uh begin again how did you you know start a new life what did you do less than gracefully Mm. um so that's the period of time when i met you and i really just to say that i stumbled out into the world is so incredibly accurate Mm. Uh, i had been so depressed and so stifled for so long that to be single and getting divorced 
collapsed mm-hmm. at 29. You know, I had so many people saying to me, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, are you ever going to be a mother? And I was like, just get me the fuck out of here. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, what? Like, I have things that I want to do. Um, so, you know, it was a really weird it, it was a really weird construct because, you know, at, at that age, people are seeking a partner. They're trying to get married. They're looking for their soulmate. And I was just like, whoa, like, I don't even know what just happened. Who am I? What am I going to do? How am I going to make money? How Like, how does this adulting thing work? Like, I I had to learn everything all over again from finances to budgeting to, you know, professionalism. I had to teach myself that I was smart because my self-confidence was so in the toilet. Um, my body image sucked, even Mm. though I was, you know, super, super thin and, um, my eating disorders were kicking up again. And it was a, a crazy time in my life. It was just like, I, it felt like, I don't know, this crazy rebirth, but in a twisted way. Yeah. So did you live on your own? Did you li- go back home to parents? How did you um, how did you start to I, rebuild your life? I asked if I could come home and my dad said no. Mm. No with love, <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah, he did. He said, you know, you're scrappy. You have a decent job. You know, you have friends in the area. Stick it out. Mm. And- stay stay where you are and i have mixed feelings about that i you know there's a big part of me that wishes that i did go home um but i didn't i stayed and i lived um at first by myself which Mm -hmm. was really excruciating and then um with roommates um and i started poking around uh with coaching and i got my i got through my first coaching certification and then i was working on building a practice. I um, applied to graduate school at the urging of one of my mentors. And so this is actually a really important story because people, community, mentors are vital for growth. And there was a woman, her name is Betsy, and she is one of the professors at the university where I worked. And she knew me and she, she was one of the first people that I was really honest with about Mm -hmm. what had been going on at home in my marriage. And she saw something in me that I couldn't see for myself. And she came to my office with regularity just to stop in and encourage me to apply to graduate school. And and for me, intellectually, at that point, the idea of applying to graduate school was terrifying Mm. terrifying why why is that because my self-worth and my concept of my own intellect was in the toilet Mm -hmm. and i didn't think that i was smart and i didn't think that i had the capacity to move about the world and i applied and i got in and i started taking classes and i kept getting a's and i was like oh holy shit and then i applied to the triple degree program and i got in um and so then i began you know maintaining a 4.0 through two master's degrees and i was building my confidence and learning a lot and learning what i wanted to learn i was studying social work and human sexuality which was Mm -hmm. a super cool combo and that's when um I met you. I I wrote to you, stranger from across the country. Hey, I'm Noelle. Here's my story. I'm a writer. I'm a coach. And you wrote back, hey, you're a great writer. Come join my team. Um, Enter the crazy Korean. Yeah, enter the crazy (laughs) Korean. Yep. Man, okay. So that it's really interesting to hear. Um, I mean, although I I know you and and I know broad strokes of your story to uh, see what happened before we collided, you know, like, um, the the positioning of where you were in your life. Um, uh, it's funny because we were kind of in the same space. Uh, me also going through a divorce, rebuilding my life. Uh, you also, you know, rebuilding yours, you getting your master's. I was, you know, I just gotten my master's. Um, there's a lot of overlap in our stories. Yes, very much so. And I, I think that's why we've continued with like such great parallels throughout our relationship. Yeah, and I got to say, uh, and this just kind of hit me now, like looking at it from um, a universe perspective, looking at it from, you know, the, the helicopter view, 
I almost feel like maybe that's why we collided, you know, two people kind of going through similar paths and um, the universe was just like, all right, here, here you, you guys need to do something together. Or, you know, maybe there's a, a, a something that you guys can do that can possibly help other people. And so um, just through email, uh, we connected. And then uh, what happened from there? So from there... I was still working in my job at the university. I was still going to graduate school, um, dating, different relationships, learning how to be in relationships, really working on codependency. Um, and I, we, we started to mess around with the ideas of the early communities. You'd been doing it for a while with the Tumblr blogs and yeah. then, um, kind of did it in the early days with the TAT community. And I think I was probably driving you nuts at that point because I'm so type A Virgo and had so much energy and, you know, can be direct and demanding. And I I, I remember emailing you a lot and being just like, oh, John hates me. <laughs> but no, I don't, okay. I don't remember that. Anyway. I don't remember that at all. Uh, but yes, I was obsessed with, um, and at that time, it, you know, th these were the early days of the internet and I was obsessed with, um, how, if it was possible to start building communities online. So uh, group group blogs and, um, you know, the, the, the Facebook blog wasn't invented yet. Um, it was, it, social media wasn't really, it was just purely social and fun. It wasn't, no one was really using social media uh, as a way to, to legitimately build communities. Yeah, yeah. And so that really caught fire for me intellectually because I had been chasing community really my whole life. And when we stumbled upon, I will never forget the energy that took place in that first secret Facebook group. There were like 500 people in there and the connection and exchange and the quality was like, oh, you know, this is where the magic is at. And, you know, this, the, the path of going on and on and on and, um, for me, where the the struggle was, was the structured, safe route of going the PhD, becoming a doctored sex therapist, working in an office in Philadelphia, or uh, jumping out of the matrix and working on a startup yeah. and building something from nothing in a field that's not regulated, that's emerging. And, you know, that push and pull is really heavy. And so I was going through that through the years of, you know, of the early years. And during that period of time, I also applied and was accepted to the PhD program, which is something that I never thought would happen in my lifetime. Is there a part of you that still wants uh, to get a PhD? It's or not no? so much. It, you know, it's it's not so much the letters, it's the research. Uh, I really yeah. like research. I really like designing and developing interventions. And I'm still very intellectually interested in the work that I want to do. But I feel like the experience of having jumped out of the matrix, having built a company, having thrown everything at the wall, having, you know, given everything to it that I have, um, and really engaging in society with lots of different diverse populations, moving, traveling, you know, experiencing broad swaths of the country, um, has been vital to informing the work that I want to do one day. I think the PhD, and of course, I don't think you're interested in that for the letters. Um, I, I think you're interested in it f uh, because you have a desire for research. Um, research, w which, by the way, repels me, but you love it. And you geek out <laughs> about it. I love it. Yeah, and it like, comes out of your pores. And I have a feeling that that PhD, that, that part of your life, um, is going to boomerang back. I don't know when. Maybe it'll be you know in your 60s, or I don't know. But I think you're going to um, pursue that, and I think you're going to – do something with it. I just have this feeling. I agree with you. Yeah. I, one day I, I will return to it, just not right now. Right, not right now, but I, I think it's going to be a part of your life. So yeah, we met, we started uh, working together. 
um, I had already kind of got the ball rolling on um, starting a coaching intensive online and that came from me being frustrated as a therapist uh, going through that journey how lonely it was uh, all the red tape uh, the inje- the invention of the internet and how in the clinical world they were they were trying to uh, instead of embrace it they were running from it so a lot of rules on what you can do and can't do online I mean basically you weren't supposed to do anything online and so um, it didn't feel honest to me so I was kind of a, a crazy scientist and uh, it actually it, it it was me tapping into the the, the little rebellious fourteen year old that wanted to play with his Legos you know and that's what I was doing um, right before I met Noel. And so when we kind of collided, um, I had this, this little little course. It, it was just very small, one-man show. And then uh, she came on board. And then uh, being the CEO and now making it an official uh, company, um, of course, in it now it's much bigger than me. And so let's talk about uh, the journey of journey. <laughs> yeah, so the journey of journey is – I think the story of community and heart driven leadership where, you know, where I'm a working coach, you're a working coach. The frustration that you experienced and how to build a practice is the frustration that I think all solo entrepreneurs experience at some point of God, I just wish I had other people to help me. And education is, is phenomenal. You know, The education that we have lined up for the intensive is stellar. We get feedback all the time that it's life changing. But the framework that encompasses that education is based on creating a space for people to build community around science that they love. Right. Now, you've actually taken many um, coaching uh, 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 courses and, and intensives yourself. What is different about Journey? Meaning, you know, why do you want Journey to hang on those things? Why is that important to you? So, you know, education is wonderful. I am, I am an education junkie. The amount of education that I have behind me is staggering. I've gone to and dropped out of five graduate programs, and I think seven, (laughs) seven to. 10, seriously, like seven to 10 coach training programs. And oh, by the way, kids at home, I didn't get started on my path to accomplish all this education until I was 29. So if you're at home thinking that life has passed you by, it has not. Um, So yeah, education is phenomenal. So I think on one hand, it's a matter of curating the best of, and that's what but we do really well. We teach really cool shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but the secondary piece that I'm the most proud of is the community because it, you can have the best ed- education in the world and yet you exist in a silo if you don't have an right. audience, if you don't have help, if you don't have other people to bounce ideas off of, if you don't have role models, mentors, friends, companions, mm-hmm. colleagues. And the organization that we have built is so much more than a training program. It is over 500 people uh, who get together, gather, engage in professional development, um, hold each other through the trials of life, express and practice vulnerability. You know, as um, a CEO, that's something that I am diehard about. I love unmasking and you know it would be so easy to curate my existence on social media and even for our coaches and I won't I refuse I'm open about struggling I'm open about depression I'm open about you know not knowing how to do things financially sometimes and having meltdowns I'm open about you know challenges of marriage and relationships all the real stuff that people like to sweep under the rug because they feel like it disempowers them is actually our superpower when we come together and say, Hey, let's help each other. That one thing you're just talking about right now, um, I think is the, for me, it's the most important element that I have to have in a partner, working with a partner, uh, as far as, uh, you know, projects, business, et cetera. Um, this idea of you 
humanizing yourself, showing yourself. Um, I, I think especially, you know, as coaches, if we want to lead and, and, and even change the, uh, the temperature possibly in the room, we have to do it by example. And so I'm very turned off um, with uh, coaches these days who uh, do a lot of pointing fingers and, you know, passing around memes and stuff, <clears throat> but they don't kind of show up. They're, they more hide. And, and, and I, I love that we don't um, – we don't promote that or we, we encourage you to show yourself. And that's always going to be the, the power, I think, in uh, the, the coach and also the coaching experience. Oh, yeah. Your story is your gold. And, you know, folks out there experience so much shame. And I would even hasten to say existential dread um, that it's important when you see somebody share their story and you identify with it. It eases your own pain. So when you're being vulnerable, when you're unmasking, when you're showing up as a human and saying, you know what, I have all of these little problems that really bug me throughout the day and this is my life and I'm super effective as a leader, as a coach, um, as an executive, period. You know, it it helps other folks feel like, well, hey, my problems don't have to dominate my life. I too can be super effective. Absolutely. Uh, so with that fire, um, what have you been doing in Journey? What are some of your goals? I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm, I'm more interviewing you. Obviously, I know, but uh, I also want the world to know um, where are you at with all this? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, when, when, when you first started the catalyst intensive, it was, um, it was a garage band. It was housed under the angry therapist. We were, I was a kid, you were a kid. We Mm -hmm. didn't know what we were doing. And, um, as the company grew, so did the responsibility for caring for and stewarding the lives of everyone who has come to us for training because it's not just a training program where it's a handshake and you walk away. Right. You become part of a living, breathing ecosystem that is becoming a force in the wellness space. And, you know, it's a big test kitchen. We're constantly trying to figure out different entry points to the field, provide different opportunities for our coaches. Um, some of the things that I learned how to do that are super fun are build strategic partnerships. So this year in March, we're taking our coaches to South by Southwest. We're part of the Wellness Expo. That is such a phenomenal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to have a retreat for all of our coaches um, because everybody just wants to get together and hang out and build that culture and build that community. Um, We're playing around with becoming um, a little bit of a coach staffing agency and a wellness staffing agency, figuring out the entry points to um, different opportunities, you know, within the wellness and business space where coaches need to be on hand. We're um, looking at ways that we could deploy coach training into different industries. So say, um, you know, there's an industry, there's just a great um, connection that I made, somebody who works with a lot of virtual assistants and the concept of empathy mapping, nonviolent communication for both managers and employees was really just kind of blowing everybody's mind. And so I said, hey, do you want me to come in and do some training seminars for you guys? Um, So things like that, that kind of are extending like tree branches, reaching out for the sun, we're kind of just really growing organically. Where do you think coaching is heading and and, and why why coaching? And um, if you want to help people, why coaching instead of going down the clinical route? They're both vital. So Mm -hmm. they're both vital. Um, The clinical route is for folks who are experiencing psychological anguish that creates dysfunction. So, you know, whatever is going on for you, you're experiencing so much pain that is it is getting in the way of you being able to function in everyday life. I have a great therapist. I check into therapy when I experience that. Coaching is for somebody who is reasonably well. Of course, we all experience psychological anguish from time to time. But in coaching land, um, coaching is for folks who 
want to leverage the insight, experience, and power of somebody else to move forward in life more rapidly than they would on their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in therapy, oftentimes awareness, healing, a feeling of acceptance is the end state. And in coaching, that's the foundation. So you have awareness, you have healing, you have acceptance. Now, what are you going to do with your time? And coaching demands accountability and um, propels folks forward. So it, it really can be bookends for therapy. So a, a lot of times, if you're starting to experience depression, one way to alleviate it is to take action in your life and to actually take control of your life and take your power back so that you don't slip into a deep depression. And then, you know, if you've gone to therapy for an acute circumstance and you're out on the other side, kind of like I was after I got divorced, looking around the world, like, what the hell am I going to do now? A coach is a great option to get you clear, to get you focused and to hold your hand and keep you accountable as you move through life. Yeah, and I love how detailed you were in that description because I think so many people um, want to coach, but they're scared because they feel like because they don't have a clinical background or a master's in psychology, they can't do it. Uh, but that's not true. And what I love about coaching today, especially, uh, and of, of course, it's, it's continuing it to grow really fast, but I love how wide it is. I love that um, that there is no board. I love that you can take any area of your life or what you've gone through or what you're passionate about and help someone in that area. Um, I love that you can do it in so many ways now because when I started, uh, there, you know, there, there, the technology wasn't there where you could, uh, you know, FaceTime and Zoom and then, you know, take money via Venmo and PayPal and create courses and retreats. Like all of that um, now has become just the norm. And so the playing field for coaching is just, I mean, it makes it so exciting because it's, it's like Disneyland right now. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a great space to be in. And, you know, in the early days, it was really hard to build a practice. Well, also and there was like that stigma, like, oh, you're a life, it, like, you yeah. know, like, it wasn't taken seriously at all. And and now, you know, for myself, for you, for the coaches who are going through our program, I'm watching people out of the gate, just mm -hmm. like killing it mm -hmm. out there. Um, there is, a, the space is really strong from a financial modeling perspective it's a good field to get into yes and that being said i also want to say that it's like building anything it takes time it's not easy you know um what a value in this world is easy and so um, if you're listening to this and you want to be a coach and you see ads of companies guaranteeing you know uh you know six figures or something um, I, I, I would run from those <laughs> because there's no guarantee and the journey of, of each coach is going to be different, you know? Yes, I, I completely agree. And, you know, coaching doesn't have to be your own brand, your own practice. We're also right. seeing tons of companies offering really great jobs for mm -hmm. coaches. Mm -hmm. So we consistently have companies saying, hey, can you post our, our jobs for your graduates? Amazon just created a position that requires a life coaching certification to apply. Well, here's the other thing. Um, whatever you learn, whether it's through our, our program or any other coaching program, uh, is going to benefit you and your life uh, no matter what. Even if you don't even decide to coach, it'll ripple into having better relationships, uh, including the relationship with yourself. So it's just, it's all, it's all, it's a win win thing. And I love that people are open to it, excited about it. And by doing it, um, they're, they're not just doing life alone, but they're now doing life in tribes. Yeah. You know what my favorite thing to do is? And, and it's like a guilty pleasure. Um, I use the techniques that we teach on myself. And um, it's, it's so great to just like get that instantaneous mental relief and be like, oh, my God, this is such good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I, I love that you do that because then you can take what you've learned, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And then that's how you're 
helping other people. I think a lot of coaches who just kind of passed a baton or, you know, cut and paste what they've learned, um, it's not as powerful because they haven't digested it themselves. Oh yeah, the best, and and that's the beauty of you know that that's why we teach experientially. So yeah. we ask everybody who goes through our program to do the techniques and then discuss it with their group. So you're bonding, you're transforming, you're learning this stuff from the inside out, and you're understanding the benefits so that when you're through with confidence, you can say to someone, "This is an awesome technique." So um, in the last like few minutes, let me ask you, where do you think coaching is headed? Yeah, so I think coaching is probably where therapy was like 40 years ago, where folks understand it. They know that Oprah has a life coach. They mm -hmm. know that there's a lot of folks taking this path. Um, so I think the field is really going to solidify. And I think that it's going to become a very well recognized discipline. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it, there are going to be a lot of positions that are created in industry for coaches um, and then in society, similar to therapy. I think it'll follow a very similar trajectory. If you have one message um, you want to tell people that either you're passionate about um, or it relates to your story or maybe it's something that um, you personally overcome, uh, what would that message be? Yeah. So, you know, when I was talking about my my story in my life, you know, there were a lot of dark chapters there and I was really open about depression and my experiences of loneliness and isolation and eating disorders um, and also my desire for community. And I'm now 39. Um, I no longer experience any of those things. Mm -hmm. I have kicked depression. Of course, I still feel depressed from time to time. Sure. I have kicked eating disorders. I have a wonderful marriage. I have a fantastic community. I've been able to generate a fantastic career um, with great colleagues. So don't give up hope. Transformation is literally possible for everyone and other people matter. So, you know, if you need help and you need community, reach out and find it because yeah. there are a lot of folks out there who are there to receive you and our org is definitely one of them uh you also have a gentle beautiful dog named yeah, george. <laughs> I do. george george where uh where can we find you noel if you have a question shoot me an email noel at journey.co and you can find us at journey.co j-r-n-i dot co yeah um so <laughs> check us out let me know what you need i'm always happy to chat and well, thank you for um, sharing your story, but thank you for also um, everything you do at Journey and uh, being such a uh, uh, an awesome partner and friend and uh, uh, just everything. Thank you. I, I actually enjoy um, building this with you, um, and I'm excited to see you know how far and, and where we take this. So, thank you for being a part of my story. John and Noel would like to invite you to a live training and Q&A session happening on September 24th, 2019. They'll be discussing career change, the many, many different ways that you can become a coach or use coach training in your current career, and answering your questions about the $4.2 trillion wellness global economy. That's right, trillion dollar. So head over to journey.co slash career to sign up. That's J-R-N-I dot C-O slash career. It's time to get the skills and training you need to make a bigger impact in the world around you. And we'll see you on September 24th.